Hi everyone, my name is Yoshitaka Oshiku and I would like to give a talk titled Invitation to Visual Language. This is my main research topic. I hope that as many people as possible will be interested in vision and language. First of all, let me introduce myself. After receiving my PhD from the University of Tokyo, I worked as a researcher at the laboratory of NTT, a Japanese telephone company. After that, I returned to the University of Tokyo as a faculty member and then moved to a research subsidiary of Omron, a healthcare and factory automation company where I am currently working. I'm still doing research at Omnosonic X, although I also have other dual jobs. I would like to introduce three numbers. What do these numbers represent? They represent three years that we experienced major events in our field of research. First, in 2011, the telephone speech recognition error rate improved by 10 percentage points. This is a shocking event in the speech signal processing community as it occurred at the benchmark where further significant improvements in accuracy were thought to be difficult to achieve. Next, in 2012, the error rate improved by 10 percentage points in an image recognition competition in which 1 million images were trained to recognize 1,000 different objects. This was also an event in a matchbox that was thought to be difficult to improve significantly with conventional methods, and it created a huge impact in the field of computer vision. The last one was in 2014. Machine translation used to be a combination of various complex modules, all attempting, all attempting to improve accuracy. However, in that year, a simpler method was used to achieve similar accuracy. And since then, this simpler method has been refined to improve the accuracy of the translation. The common technology in all of this is, yes, deep learning. Before the advent of deep learning, image recognition and machine translation each had complex pipelines. First, image recognition involved extracting local descriptors from the entire image, then extracting a high-dimensional vector representation and finally, identifying the uh, Taikyat as such, each of these modules was an unfamiliar piece of technology to natural language processing researchers. The machine translation process begins by segmenting each word or phrase of an input Japanese sentence, aligning it with the target language, and finally translating it to, into an English sentence. Each of these modules was an unfamiliar piece of technology to computer vision researchers. After the advent of deep learning, we can now use a neural network called a convolutional neural network to recognize an image and classify it as a target. And we can also use variants of this convolutional neural network to create a semantic segmentation system. On the other hand, machine translation has also shifted to the use of recurrent neural networks, which are neural networks that handle series of data and translate from Japanese to English, for example. In fact, this CNN, it's the same technology used in machine translation by natural language processing researchers. Recurrent neural networks are also used by computer vision researchers for time series data, such as video. Thus, more than just improving accuracy in a specific modality, another revolution is that researchers in slightly different fields of computer science can now easily understand each other by replacing various 
previously dispelled uh, displayed technologies uh, with various types of neural networks. This is another revolution. An even bigger trend is the ex explosion of user-generated content. Nowadays, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, etc. don't even bother to publicly disclose how many images and videos they have on their services. The amount of multimedia data uploaded is so massive that it is not longer possible for everyone or of us to go through it all on our own. In addition to images and videos, there is also a great deal of relevant information in the form of text. Against, against this backdrop, for example, building uh, studies such as this one began to emerge around 2010. Here, we are working on caption generation for images with articles. This is a research project that outputs captions for images that appear in a news story when the text of the news story and the image that appear in the news story are inputted. The authors collected a dataset of these news images and captions, and then machine learning to actually output those captions is developed. A number of initiatives have emerged from these studies. The first one is called visual question answering. Here, the input image is accompanied by a related question. The bottom of this image. Uh, to answer this question, we need to recognize what the dog is chewing on. As shown in the image of the light, uh, by using a famous module called an attention mechanism, it is possible to estimate that the correct answer is a carrot by paying attention to what is being chewing on by dog mouse. Next is the second example of visual question answering. The second example is this one, which asks, um, what color is a traffic light? In fact, there is a traffic light in the middle of the image that is about two pixels by two pixels in size. We have succeeded in the getting answer green by applying the attention precisely to the traffic light. The first of group of the research uh, between vision language is on multimodal understanding, which date from multiple modalities such as images and the questions are input, and the results of the recognition are output. Next, we have an example of image caption generation. Here, we can output a sentence consisting of 10 words describing the content of the input image. For example, group of people sitting at the table with a dinner or tourists are standing in the middle of the flat desert. This is an example of an image to text problem that produces text data uh, as output from an input image. Let's look at the next problem. Image generation from a caption, for example, an uh, illustration of a baby hedgehog in a wizard hat riding a car can be generated exactly like that. The third group is text and image research in which images are output when text is input. If you give a sentence like the one in the middle to the image on the left, the image will appear as a new image as shown on the right. In this way, a group called image plus text to image that outputs a new image based on the input of an image and text can be seen. 
Next, I would like to give an example of visual dialogue. In visual dialogue, for example, using the image in the lower center as an example, two dialogue agents can talk to each other using natural language. There is also research on image plus text to text, where text data is newly generated from visual and text data input. More recently, after the three major events of 2011, 2012, and 2014, another event that occurred in 2017 uh, was the emergence of a neural network called Transformer. A great deal of research utilizing this Transformer has also appeared. Transformer is a technology that transforms an arbitrary number of vectors into an arbitrary number of vectors in an encoder-decoder fashion and has been used extensively in visual and language research in recent years. In this lecture, I would like to introduce various research themes in visual and language according to the five categories I have just introduced. And finally, I would like to talk about the common topics and the future prospects. First of all, I would like to talk about the first research theme of visual and language, which is recognition from March model input. First, visual question answering was initially focused in the field of user interfaces. A blind person would take a picture of what he or she was holding, as shown in the image on the left, and ask a question about it. The way to answer this question is to take a photo with an iPhone and send it to Amazon Mechanical Turk workers around the world as shown the light. They would see the question with their own eyes, see the picture with their own eyes, and then give the answer back to you. This is exactly the interface. Research on Ultimate, uh, this gradually began to emerge after that. And the study called Visual Question Answering was published in 2015. This is a landmark study in which a data set was developed and the benchmark baseline pipeline was tested. The authors have also been running a portal site and organizing competitions. The VQA data set is an amazing data set that involves a very costly data correction process, which involves correcting questions about each image on Amazon Mechanical Turk, and then correcting 10 answers to each question. We take an image input, extract image features from it, take a question input, extract question features from it, and build a match class classifier on a vector of features that integrates these two types of features by some means. As the output of that classifier, we can train uh, this much class classification problem with each of the known answers in the training dataset as a single class. So, whether it consists of two words like bed seats here or one word like Pillars, you are training a match class classifier to identify them all as one separate level. This is another task called visual natural language inference, which is a three valued classification of relation between an input image and a sentence. For example, when an image here comes in, the relationship between this image, the sentence in green, is a description of exactly what is contained in this image. 
So the relation here is entailment. Next, this is yellow one. This is the sisters are hugging goodbye while holding to go to package after just eating lunch, which may or may not be true. For example, they may be hugging each other as a greeting where they mate. So the correct answer here is neutral. And uh, furthermore, the third content is contradiction here because this is a text that has nothing to do with the image at all. Basically, the approach is the same as BQA, extracting the feature of the image and the features of this hypothesis and learning uh, three classes using these fused features. The next task is visual grounding. Uh, which output uh, are part of the image based on the input image and the query sentence. As shown in the example on the right, if an image of a curl is input and the sentence query like white curl on the right is input, the output of this program is the region of the curl on the right side of the image. If this candidate image region is a region within a single image, as it is now, the task is called referring expression comprehension. If, the, uh, if there are multiple images and one of them is to be selected as the answer on image by image basis, then it becomes a textual image search. Thus, in this paper, textual image retrieval is also solved simultaneously with referring expression comprehension. The following example shows a robot solving a pick and press task with human verbal instructions. Based on the user's voice instructions, the robot grabs the desired object from the box in the upper right corner. This is also an example of a referring expression comprehension where the user's instruction are exactly referring expressions and the robot is able to recognize that it should grab the object in the red box based on the technology described earlier. Next, I would like to introduce a study of how to improve accuracy by re-estimating the phrase of the input once it has been estimated in the image. This will be one of the examples of a study that makes effective use of the going and coming back loss function, which I will discuss later. To illustrate what I mean again using the figure on the right, Suppose that the sentence, a small boy, is entered as a query for an incoming image. For the image of the boy, is uh, if the image of the boy is successfully output, the neural network re-estimates the phrases that describe this image. Then, if this first query sentence and the sentence re-estimated from the image area are exactly the same, it means success. If you had output an image region of another dog or a young man here instead of the small boy, then, of course, the phrase would be different. And that's where the loss occurs. This is how we are able to accurately output the region that the input referring expression is actually referring to. The loss that occurs after the output is called consistent consistency loss, which is a loss function that calculates whether or not the output of the input can be returned to the input again. This is an important loss 
to make effective use of the information in peer data, such as a pair of images and text. For example, when a caption is output for this image, an autoencoder is used to decode the image again from the caption to get the original image. The right side is similar to the previous example of referring expressions, but if the man in the blue box here is successfully output as the image area for referring, referring expression comprehension, and then the uh, referring expression is generated only within that image area, the loss is calculated to see if the original referring expression can be returned. This is similar to the cycle consistency of the cycle again. This is a very common visual language loss function that uses only the pairwise nature of the uh, paired data who are learning. Next, I would like to explain vision and language navigation. The input here is a text that is given directions from the starting point to the destination point and an image of the scene that the agent is currently seeing in the house. From these two pieces of input data, um, the problem is to estimate actions such as which direction to go, whether to turn right, left, or stop, and so on. So, this is an example of multimodal recognition where actions are estimated from the site, uh, site images and instructional text. The data of a real house in the world is obtained in 3D, and each point in the house is represented as a node in the form of a graph connected by edges. The problem is to estimate the series of movements in the virtual environment obtained in this way as described earlier. Um, therefore, it is similar to visual question answering in some respects, but the biggest difference is that the input image in vision and language navigation is different from time to time. In this uh, sense, in the sense that the um, input is a series and the output is also a series, the input-output structure is similar to that of machine translation. Next, I like to explain the second category of vision language, which is the task to produce a text when an image is input. I'll start with text search by image here, but I like to explain caption generation. This is not to say that I skipped text search by image. The reason is that the first study for image caption generation was exactly the kind of approach for text search by image. In the paper, every picture tells a story the first step is to manually provide a data, data set of images, their captions, and a triplet of what is an object, what is an action, and what is a scene. The object action scene triplet of new images are, take, are then estimated using Markov random field. For the result of this triplet estimation, the caption with the most similar triplet in the training dataset is output as is. As a concrete example, when an image like this comes in, this is a triplet that is output. The caption on the training layer is the one that happens to be similar to the input image. In this next image, the triplet is a bit suspicious because of the words pet, sleep, 
and ground. Didn't the system find any training data uh, with a similar triplet? See something unexpected. So the caption is a bit different from the input image. In this way, many studies, especially in the early stages, uh, took an approach similar to retrieval, reusing existing captions as they were. On the other hand, when there was a need to generate new captions, there was a little attention paid to the use of templates. However, the first problem with reusing caption is that the, there must be as many different captions as there are various input images. It is basically impossible to output the perfectly correct caption for input images by the using approach. If you use a template, you will have to generate a template that is diverse enough to cover a wide variety of inputs, or you will not uh, be able to generate captions correctly. So, we would like to generate captions that do not rely on templates, but it was initially thought to be a very difficult problem how to generate captions that are fluent and that match all the contents of the input image. By the way, this approach to image reuse is also widely studied as cross-modal research. In fact, the research presented here was conducted after new caption generation became possible, and it is reported as an approach to cross-modal search rather than use for capturing. The example at the bottom is an input-output result that shows how videos and such captions can be mutually searched. Now, as for how to generate a new caption, the following research was done before deep learning. The hypothesis here is that if we generate a few key phrases that describe the image and then use a grammatical model to connect them correctly, the key phrases will contain the important relationship between objects, so all we need to do is connect them correctly and then will become a caption. The key phrase estimation is a very important part of image recognition process. The authors pro um, propose an approach that uses an image recognition approach to estimate key phrases and then use a natural language processing module to connect the key phrases. In these examples, the key phrase in the middle was estimated for the input image on the left side, and the sentence on the right side was generated afterwards. Later, Google and others simultaneously proposed deep learning approaches at the CBPL in 2015. The Google Neural Image Captioning method combines a feature extraction module of CNN for image recognition developed by Google and LSTM to translated sentences developed by Google. What I say may sound complicated, but in reality, all you have to do is to put the convolution neural network and the uh, recurrent neural network together. The network structure is actually very simple, so that captions can be generated from the input image. Even so, the effect was great, and we are able to output a fairly fluent sentence for input images. Now, to make the problem more difficult, research was emerged in the field of dense captioning, which detects multiple regions on an image and generated a caption for each of them, rather than a single caption generation for the in entire image. In addition, 
There have been developments such as the generation of captions, not only for a single image, but also for a series of the images, such as an album, by connecting each caption as a story. Next, there is a research uh, that generates recipes that show the exact, exact steps of cooking for a sync sequence of images of a recipe such as this. In this research, for each step in a sequence of research uh, images and a list of ingredients, the process of estimating which ingredients came together at the, which step as a single structural data, and then generating a research uh, lisp ca caption from that structure. The next group is referring expression generation. This is the reverse version of the referring expression understanding described earlier. Referring expression comprehension was a task that gave an image and query output the image region that match the query. Now, given an image and a region within the image, the task is to generate a description that is uniquely specific to the image region. In fact, this task has a very long history. In the field of building block called pseudo, uh, referring expression generation was used in the research to create commands to manipulate the building blocks. A common approach is to optimize all the same as the uh, referring expression understanding I just uh, explained and the going and coming back loss is often used here as well. What this means is that given an image and a specific region of the image, we first try to generate the referring expression from it. And then uh, we try to find a specific region in the image uh, with that referring expression which is solved at the same time. This is an efficient machine learning method because even images without a referring expression can be added to the training data for semi-supervised learning. Another common approach is to use reinforcement learning. Reinforcement learning is also a very common idea in vision and language tasks. So please keep it in mind. First, there are two modules, a listener that understands the referring expression and the speaker that generates the referring expression. The reinforcer, uh, which matches the correct answer to the region found by the listener with the referring expression generated by the speaker and generates a reward, makes the referring expression generation more accurate. Next is visual question generation. This is a reverse version of visual question answering. For example, the research presented here is visual question generation for unknown pro objects. There are definitely objects in our living space that are unknown to the AI performing image recognition. We want AIs to recognize such objects. So when there is an unknown object, we want AIs to ask a question to us, but it is not suitable to ask any question from AI to human. For example, a value question like, what is this, may cause a value answer like object. Therefore, AI should ask uh, what it knows and what it doesn't know about the unknown object. For example, in this example, um, AI knows that it is a stuffed toy, but it doesn't know uh, the detailed class. 
So the correct answer is teddy bear. As a generated example, in the middle image, AI knows that the man is wearing a shirt, but it does know it doesn't know uh, that the described class is a t-shirt. The AI can ask uh, what kind of shirt it is. This is how the question generation works. Now, I'd like to talk about the next group of research, which is a generation of images from text. Here, I would like to refer again to the previous example of cross-modal search. The slides here is exactly the same, but uh, there is research being conducted by simultaneously solve the search for images with text and the search for text with images. Because we can perform image search from text, we also want to generate new images from text, just as with caption generation. But actually, generating images has been a rather uh, difficult task. For example, here in the example presented at, at the international conference called iCREA in 2016, the example was shown by inputting, please generate an image of a school bus in this way. And then changing the color in the text would actually change the image. But I suggest that you don't put your face too close to the screen. If you get too close, it's not a bus anymore. If you look at it from a distance, and try not to pay attention, it might be a bus. This was such a difficult problem at first uh, that it was presented at iCREA, the top international conference on deep learning. Of course, image editing has been studied at international conferences on computer graphics and like before, but it was difficult to generate a new image from scratch. The first step in image generation is use of GAN. In the 2010s, there was a lot of research of image generation using two modules that perform adversarial learning consisting of a generator and a discriminator. When you want to generate images based on the content of the text, you input text to both the generator and discriminator. The generator will not only generate a natural image, but will also generate an image that matches the text. What the discriminator does is not only to detect unnatural images, but also to detect images that do not match the text. So here is an example of how it works with a bird-only dataset and a flower-only dataset. For example, when we gave this detailed description of a bird, the method is able to generate an image like the one on the bird on the right. And uh, in the case of a flower, the method is able to generate an image like the one below. However, if you get really close to the screen, you may notice that the bird is disjointed and the flower is quite distorted. So, as a subsequent development, a model with multiple GANs called the stack GAN is introduced. So, uh, the first GAN produces the images with the same low resolution and in some cases, a little roughness as in the previous studies. The second again, which also receives text input, first increases the, the resolution of the image produced by the first again, and then produces an image with more detail within that higher resolution. 
the second discriminator of the GAN also checks to see if the image is in accordance with the text. In this way, by using a two-stage GAN, the first GAN generates small resolution images, and then the second GAN that determines the details in high resolution. The method is able to generate quite beautiful images of birth and flowers. However, even with this approach, the results were still limited to flower and bird specific datasets, and it was still difficult to generate images that truly reflect a variety of objects, such as datasets commonly used for image caption generation. However, the technology announced in 2021 under the same under the name of Dali, uh, which used transformers to generate highly realistic images in a different way that was not based on advisory learning, uh, got very popular. The idea is that the combination of transformers and the quantized BAEs actually do the autoregressive generation of images. Then such beautiful images can be generated. There really are uh, the many images of cats using uh, using cabbage. Are there? The fact that various images of cats with cabbage can be generated in this way suggests that. It is possible to generate new images by running the data set well, and this become a very popular topic. Then in 2022, DALI 2, uh, which is a diffusion model came out and it become even more popular for its ability to generate even more realistic images. This research, has been ex extremely impactful in that many people, even ordinary people, are now using this kind of image generation AI. Dari 2 uh, has a network structure called CREEP and leverages image and text representation learning and the diffusion model. When features are extracted from input text, they are made to be close to image features extracted from paired images in value by the representation learning creep. When the text feature are fed into the diffusion model, the diffusion model gradually transforms the Im image from uh, random pixels to uh, realistic images like this. In fact, there is a possibility that the diary uh, has another aspect of the generative AI, uh, which I would like to introduce here. Here is an image generated by Dali uh, when it receives a prompt such as two farmers are talking about vegetables. You can see what looks like text in the image. It appears above the two farmers and uh, in the speech bubbles, but no matter what language you use, you probably can't read this text. When you get to the bottom, it looks like the letters are made up of something that is not a normal alphabet. So, as a generated text meaningless here, Let's input only this word like stringy, string, be cutest, and let Dali uh, generate an image. You will see various visible like things like this. So the word be cutest may be related to vegetables. Next, in the center of the balloon, as I mentioned earlier, some of the letters are a bit suspicious, but if you apply them to the letters of the alphabet that are somewhat close, and then enter words like this, a bird appears in the image. So, 
If you go back and look at the image again, you will see a string seemingly incomprehensible letters at the top of the image, which tells us uh, that they're talking about vegetables and the new language is created by Jerry appears as a word for vegetables. The word in the speech baron between the farmers represented a bird. The AI may be creating a new language that makes us imagine that the converse, um, conversation between the two farmers about the vegetable is about damage caused by birds or something else. Changing the research topic. Let's see if it is possible to generate video as well as images. This is a result in 2017, but this kind of moving figures and moving human-like objects were generated as videos. This research is presented at the top computer vision conference, ICCB. Last year, on the other hand, the, the diffusion model and now can generate much clearer moving objects. As a result of combining now, uh, which can render image uh, from various viewpoints with the diffusion model, generating a certain 3D object from text and spinning it around um, from various angles is possible. In this way, you can see uh, how innovations are being made to the point where beautiful continuous images can be generated. The fourth cluster is a research to output a new image from the input image and text. Here, I would like to introduce image editing with text. Earlier, I introduced a research paper that used the GAN to generate images from text. In fact, in that paper, there is also an example of further editing of image content with text. When a GAN is well trained, the following things are actually happening. First of all, the input text feature Y represents the main content of the image. The fact that uh, some realistic image can be generated from it means that information other than the main content, for example, that the background is green and grass-like, is coming from somewhere else. Where that information is, we can say that it is contained in the variable z, which was generated down randomly at the beginning. In this way, we can hypothesize that the kind of disentanglement has been achieved here. We could then train another convolutional neural network that would inversely estimate its background z from an image. Then, if we assume that the main content is pi and the rest of the background is contained in Z, we can let it pass estimate the background Z when an image is input, and then combine it with the feature pi from another text to generate the image. The result of the image generation is the same as that of the text. The result of that image generation is exactly the result of image editing with a similar background and a different context. We can see that the result might actually be an image that is a cross between the input sentence and the first images. Furthermore, there is another method trying to learn by directly building on this data using adversarial learning. In this simplest case, if we wanted to perform supervised learning of this kind of image editing, we would need to correct many sets of an image before editing, the text of editing instructions, and another images um, showing after editing. This is indeed difficult, isn't it? So in this study, 
the authors are uh, sampling the text T paired with images, text T hat, having totally different contexts, and text T words uh, that are in the same category, for example, images of the same type of bird. Of course, since text T words are not paired text, they will have different context, even though they are in the same category. For the generated image, if we design the output output of this discriminator with text X and T hat T bar as shown in the slide, we can utilize the T bar as a kind of hard negative samples. The discriminator will be able to detect text T bars that are in the same category but slightly different contents. The generator that we learned from discriminator can only generate images with text content that is really appear. The baseline is a result of the approach that was worked on the, um, the original Gian paper that is introduced earlier, which is to disentangle Z and Y to generate the edited images. Compared to this, you can see on the right side of the image that the number of artifacts and the suspicious parts have been reduced. In fact, a questionnaire survey conducted among various users showed that the proposed approach produced better edited images. In addition, in this example, the authors propose an approach called change caption generation, which utilizes another caption generation method for feedback. In the example at the top right, for example, the task of changing the content of an image by providing text is mutually linked to change caption generation, which generates the change in context uh, between two images. The proposed method can use a cyclic consistency that is similar to the going to and coming back loss. In the proposed method, the image request attention module first estimates what areas are edited in the input caption and then evaluates the edited content itself by calculating the lead description similarity score. The content of the edit itself is evaluated by calculating the lead de description similarity score. This RSS is exactly what I was talking about earlier, utilizing the caption changes between uh, the pre-edited and the post-edited images. By comparing the correct data of the actual edited image and the generated images, and by utilizing similarity score, it is possible to edit the image in a manner similar to actual change caption generation. The leftmost example of input output is the input and grant truth. And you can see how the output on the uh, proposal method on the right side are uh, similar to the input output. This is the last category. Uh, the next category is merge model translation, which is the output of language from vision language. The original idea of merge model translation was inspired by a 2012 reports that suggest that if images were available as crews, the accuracy of machine translation would improve. For example, as shown in the middle of the report, um, there is the English word seal, which can be which can mean different things. Is it a seal similar to a stamp? or it is a seal of a sea animal. If you don't know, the word will be translated incorrectly, but if you have the image crew here, then you 
can see that the texts are about sea animals, and the translation should be correct. So, as a multimodal machine translation, when an image and uh, its associated caption are input, the caption should be translated. If there is no image, for example, the last word is incorrectly translated as rock, when in the fact the correct answer is skirt. The method um, select correct translation result by ranking the image caption pairs from the candidate translation results. As another research theme, I would like to introduce an example of visual dialogue that produces text from in image and text inputs. In this case, there is visual information in addition to the textual information of the people who are having the conversation. There is a lot of research going on, for example, to provide such datasets or to use such datasets for dialogue. As a glossary of terms, the term multimodal dialogue also comes up quite often. The original multimodal dialogues were those in which the user's own information, such as facial expressions and tone of voice, was acquired in a multimodal manner. What I'm talking about here is the use of images as a context other than user information, such as facial expressions or tones. Recently, there are many cases um, where the same approach is used while calling it multimodal dialogue, but here I would like to call it vision aware dialogue to distinguish it from original multimodal dialogue. Some research is being done to model the dialogue itself, but there is also a great deal of research that aims to solve existing computer vision problems with interaction. As an example, I would like to introduce an example of research that uses dialogue for image retrieval. This is a study in which two dialogue agents learn whether they can actually do this image search after 10 rounds of Q&A session them. Particularly, the questioner is the agent that actually performs the image search. The questioner does not know what kind of image is the correct answer, nor does it know what kind of image the other agent, the, the answerer, is looking for. The answerer has a rough idea of the image it wants to search for. First, the answerer tells the questioner about the general content of the image. The questioner, of course, does not yet know which image the answer wants to search for from this rough description. So the, the questioner asks various questions about it. The answer wants the questioner to find the image it is looking for. So the answer gives the appropriate answer in more detail. After repeating this Q&A 10 times, if the questioner can, be, can find, find the image that the answerer is looking for out of many possible images, then both agents win. I'd like to talk a little about why they use language. The most trivial solution here is that when the questioner asks a question like I just showed, the answerer just sends the image features to the questioner instead of replying to the questions. If all you wanted to do was to communicate information between two agents, you would have used this type of input output, but why use language only? It could be seen as a way to avoid such a trivial solution by using the language as a bottleneck. We can also create 
an application where a human comes in instead of an answer, um, instead of an answer, and asks the questioner to interactively interactively search for images. The way the dial is conducted is through a hierarchical recurrent encoder decoder, which generates a question Q and the response A and understands the question. For the answer, the first step is to extract the future Y from the image in the center of the middle and then generate a new answer A to the question Q referring to the history of old Q and A's. The questioner, on the other hand, does not see the image, so it actually generates a new question Q from the history of previous Q and A other than the image. In addition, the answer A returned by the answer earlier is integrated with the question Q and the Q and A history is updated and the image feature uh, Y hat T uh, estimated from the features in this history. This feature Y hat T is then combined with, uh, with the enforcement learning to, to perform a nearest neighbor search of the images in the dataset. And if the correct image is retrieved, a reward is generated. As an example of visual dialogue, the questioner does not see the image in the middle. The answerer can see the image and first explains a summary sentence. From, the, uh, from there, the agent uh, talking to each other in a Q&A format, asking questions such as gender and whether the person is an adult or a child. There are many other studies that have been reported, such as much more dialogues between shopkeepers and customers by a tech store, images of actual products in the stories, in the store. Finally, I would like to talk about common topics and the future prospects of vision and language. The first topic is about datasets. Datasets can be roughly divided into those crawled from the web and those created by crowdsourcing appropriate caption and image pairs. One of the characteristics of the datasets crawled crawled from the web is that they can be constructed from very large image caption pairs, such as 1 million or 100 million images even from 10 years ago. However, these captions are only those that have been added as captions on image posting sites, so we cannot be sure that the captions are truly accurate and straightforward about the context of the images. Therefore, there are many datasets that use crowdsourcing to have accurate captions added to the images. In the old days, there were about 1,000 or tens of thousands of images that are manually captioned with five captions each. There is also a very famous dataset called Coco, in which five captions are manually generated for a relatively large image set of more than 100,000 images. There are various other datasets with manually generated captions, but the Visual Genome dataset is also very elaborate, with captions, Q&A, etc. added to uh, 100,000 images in a similar manner to dense captioning. Coco and the Visual Genome are often used as a base for other researches and their datasets. And new vision and language challenges are solved by adding other metadata. Afterwards, there are a really lot of these kinds of datasets out there. 
A larger dataset that collects hundreds of millions of image caption pairs from the web is used for training Creep, which is being used for image text representations. A more complex dataset is a combination dataset of text and video, which is a kind of dense captioning for each region of an image and uh, more complex captioning for a region from a time to another time on the video. There are also multimodal datasets that include audio and uh, point crowds as modalities, and even a history of the mouse cursor's position to indicate where to look during the description. So here are some examples of other recent multimodal datasets. The first is a dataset that includes gestures. This is a dataset that includes not only an image and a different, different expression, but also a video of a human actually appearing in the video and pointing at the object that the referring expression is referring to. From this dataset, the authors are conducting baseline experiments to estimate where the referring expression is actually referring to. In this example, on the right here in the middle, there is a referring expression that says the lug on the floor. So where is the lug on the floor? The Ground truth is green ground, uh, bounding box, but the red frame surrounds a completely different area as a result of the prediction in the beginning. beginning. The user then comes on the screen and gradually points to the correct object, but in the process of pointing to the correct object, the prediction results still refer to a different object. In the end, the method is able to output the same place as the ground truth that this user is pointing to as a result of understanding the referring expression. In other cases, as you can see, the method are also able to correctly understand the referring expression with the help of gestures. In the next example, we have a BQA dataset with audio, which is a 360-degree video and audio. The authors corrected questions that can only be answered correctly if a method understands both the visual and audio information. The next example is a dataset of historical buildings for each, a point cloud is generated from multiple images, each of which contains a number of images and captions. So now, I'd like to talk about evaluation metrics. One of the concerns of vision and language is how to evaluate the quality of a certain method for a certain task. And the simplest way to do that is to take a subjective evaluation. The first advantage of this way is that it directly reflects people's subjective opinions. So if we are able to provide appropriate instruction to these people, we can directly measure the superiority or inferiority of the method. On the other hand, if another person wants to propose a new method, and she or he wants to measure its superiority or inferiority uh, to other methods, recompiling the questionnaire to include other methods as well is required. The cost of this becomes extremely high. On the other hand, objective evaluation means that it is possible to calculate such accuracy as some kind of indicator. The um, the good thing about this way is that we do not have to collect people and take a questionnaire again and again. We can evaluate it only whether the score is state of the art or not. On the other hand, even if a state of the art score is obtained, if it is not known whether the score really 
correlates with people's subjective evaluation or not, there is a possibility that the human evaluation will show no significant differences between other methods. Or conversely, other methods will be better. First of all, for the objective evaluation of multimodal understanding, the recognition results for such multimodal input should be evaluated as accuracy. For example, in the case of visual question answering, the accuracy of class classification is measured by having 10 people return answers to the visual question periods. And if there are uh, three or more of the answers match, the accuracy is scored as one point and the average is used as a VQA evaluation metric. In the case of visual and language navigation, the output is a result of the movements. So if the triangle is the start point and the pink dotted line here is a goal point, the ratio of stopping within three meters of the goal point is used. This is a first evaluation metric for visual and language navigation. Another evaluation indicator is the length of the remaining path to the goal. The third evaluation metric is the length of the path itself, which is calculated based on how close it is to the correct red line path. In this example, for example, it is possible that an agent could have arrived in the pink dotted line area after walking around various places as shown in the blue line. <laughs> the paper points out this problem and proposing adding the difference in the length between the path generated and the correct path as an evaluation indicator. As another example, in the case of referring expression comprehension, the output is a bounding region, bounding box, which can be evaluated by intersection of a union in the same way as in object detection. The next case is when the output is visual data. This is the case when the output is an image from a caption. And an image generation evaluation metric is used here, uh, just like in Gyan. For example, the inception score is a measure uh, of how well the generated image is identified, classified by other image recognizers. The fresh inception distance is basically an improved version of the inception score utilizing the distance between the distribution of vectors in the middle of the image recognizer. The other case is that if the generated result is text, how to evaluate the text here? So for example, given multiple captions for an image like this, how close each caption is to the reference captions is evaluated quantitatively. quantitatively. This is exactly what machine translation is evaluated. This is a um, translation metric used in machine translation, a metric used in text summarization, and or a new metric for caption generation. For example, there are much for reference captions for an image like this. And blue or NIST uses an engram precision between the output caption uh, by the system and the reference captions. Next metrics such as rouge, which correspond to the evaluation metric for summarization, use engram recall of the caption and the reference captions generated by the system. Another evaluation is based on ranking. In other words, it is a metric for ranking problem. Of course, if there is only one correct answer, the best output is to search it at the top 10, a top one, 
But even if there is not at the top, searching at the top three or five is better than searching at the top 10. This is a kind of evaluation for ranking problem. However, in fact, ranking performance can be evaluated even with technologies that generate new captions. If we score existing captions that are subject to search based on the model of caption generation methods in terms of likelihood, such as uh, such as each of generation and use that for ranking, we can evaluate them as a ranking issue. As a representation example of a well-known caption generation method that has been proposed, I would like to introduce CIDR. This is a modification of Meteor, a machine translation metric uh, that emphasizes both recall and precision and utilizes cumulative precision and um, recall in end graphs. Next, I would like to talk about common ideas. Because this is a much model and difficult, difficult task, there are various innovations that can be seen in common. The first is attention. It is not necessary to mention this now, but the fact is that the attention mechanism was proposed for image caption generation at about the same time that the attention mechanism was first proposed for machine translation. In this paper in 2015, a uh, method using attention mechanism to generate captions for input images proposed. A caption is generated by repeatedly uh, estimating one word at a time by looking at the area of the image to estimate the word. The attention mechanism is used to estimate which area of the input image is the best area to look at. When estimating the word frisbee here, you can see that the attention is strongly applied to the area where the woman is throwing something from her hand. In the example of the light, when the word dog in a dog is being inferred, the attention mechanism uh, have thought that it would be better to focus on the object in the middle of the image based on the word uh, alone. And this shows that the dog area is strongly attached to the word dog. In the beginning, there were many studies uh, that performed BQA and caption generation by learning this kind of attention mechanism on, from only images and caption data. The first innovation was to apply this type of attention. The next idea is consistency loss, which was introduced earlier. This is a loss that occurs when the method is going and coming back between pair data. The third one, which was also introduced in the middle of this talk, is the use of reinforcement learning. For example, in caption generation using reinforcement learning, the estimation of the word series can be considered as actions, and the evaluation metric itself can be used as a reward to optimize the caption captioning method. In caption generation, methods are trained using the likelihood of estimating each word, and from there, we perform cross entropy of optimization. Since cross entropy does not necessarily optimize the evaluation metric, caption generation that can directly optimize the evaluation metric like this is useful. As I mentioned earlier, the enforcement learning is also being used in other um, areas such as the differing expression comprehension and vision and language navigation. The fourth way of doing this is 
uh, through examples of pre-training and representation learning. For example, for each modality, a CNN or a transformer model is trained on a large data set such as ImageNet for images or T5 for text. And then additional data sets are used for fine tuning for a certain visual language task. Furthermore, the popularity of transformers has led to the emergence of a variety of representation learning methods. This is related to GPT that has been mentioned a lot. Recently, the GPT-4 handles both images and text, and the creep, which was introduced in the middle of the GPT-4, uh, also has a big representation of both images and whole sentences. Despite all these innovations, there are still some difficulties. First of all, it is difficult to collect data set. As a typical example, I take the example of vision and language navigation here. It is difficult to provide the correct instructions for such a movement route by hand, because it has to be done manually. On the other hand, the environment inside the house is very varied from house to house, so it is very difficult to learn. What kind of solutions can be taken? There is the use of reinforcement learning to create losses other than simple supervised learning loss, as well as data augmentations. The image shown below is a vision and language navigation version of a mix-up. Ordinary mix-up is, for example, a, a mix of images and labels but here, the data augmentation by mixing a house with instruction is proposed for vision and language navigation. Other approaches have also been introduced, such as machine learning to generate such pathways and instructions for data augmentation. Another difficulty, and this one is more critical, is that an accuracy does not necessarily increase when the system becomes much model. For example, visual question answering can be seen as a task that adds vision to the natural language processing task of question answering. But in fact, the VQA dataset contains questions that are not related to images. There have been studies that uh, have found that the there are questions in the VQA dataset that are not related to the images and then removed. Another thing is that it has been reported that even without looking at the image, the correct answer can be obtained to some extent only with question text and bias that this answer is usually given in such cases. Therefore, there is a paper about eliminating the bias in the dataset by using adversarial uh, regularization. Another example is multimodal machine translation. Multimodal machine translation has been the subject of the competition at International Conference on Machine Translation, and it has been shown that the use of image is not much different from the approach without images in terms of their performances, or uh, that the accuracy of the translation result is not affected that much by the use of unrelated images. In fact, the accuracy was not so different from that of translation using only text. What this means is that the dataset collected for much modal machine translation is a corpus of translations that can be translated adequately using only the input sentences. So the translation can be done without images. On the other hand, if you want to translate a voice-recognized input for a real-world application, 
Uh, there are some situations where a part of the input sentences could not be heard, as in the case of the source shown in this slide. If there is an image related to the input sentences, it may be possible to translate it while filling the lost information from the input sentence. This means that we need to consider a more appropriate multimodal vision and language theme with complementary inputs and outputs. I'd like to conclude this talk with a saying that hurts our uh, ears. Um, this is a lecture from the Computer Vision After Five Years Workshop at CBPL 2019. Who is giving the talk is Professor Efros, who is a PA in the lab that publishes a paper about peaks to peaks utilizing cycle consistency, which is a single model version of going and coming back loss that I introduced in this talk. He mentioned visual language as one of the possibilities of, for computer vision in the five years. Sounds good to us, but look closely at the slide to see what is written. In one of these X years, some new version of visual language dataset is proposed and new benchmark, new task is proposed. The next year, the same level of accuracy in comparison to the baseline in the last year is achieved with nearest neighbor or with only one of these modalities. In his opinion, vision is not yet as well grounded to symbols as languages. I'd like to add my uh, own opinion that blind baselines of nearest neighbor search and the single modality one are not strong in all tasks. So this is a little bit of um, exaggeration, um, but caption translation is exactly the kind of the task that Professor Efros is referring to. So, it may be dangerous to think that simply adding more modalities to uh, existing tasks that already exist, uh, such as translation or BQA. At this time, at the same time, we can generalize that it is dangerous to add multiple modalities as inputs and outputs in this way. For examples of cross-modal methods, there are multiple modalities in each input and output, such as text to image, image to text. The problem cannot be solved in principle by simply using a single blind modality, but it is dangerous to just increase the number of modalities as much model methods. So be careful not to innocently think of a new much model task, create a data set or a much model deep learning baseline, and say that this is definitely the benchmark and the task that everyone should pay attention to in the future. To summarize, this talk was an overview of um, deep learning research on visual language, which is a fusion of computer vision and natural language processing. I also discuss common topics such as datasets, evaluation metrics, and common innovations and difficulties in deep learning. I'd like to conclude this talk with a hope that the new research that fuses vision and language will emerge from among those who have listened to this talk. Thank you for your attention.